Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Photo Justice Conversations. Today, with my good friend, Sean Bagshaw, a local here in Ashland, Oregon, and quite frankly, the best damn landscape photographer I know. Oh, wow. Well, hey, you know, you gotta you, start somewhere. You know a lot of photographers. I know a lot so of photographers. I know a lot of landscape photographers. You're, <laughs> you're kind of unique in that. So uh, for anyone not familiar with the show here, the whole idea is we're just gonna have a, a little chit chat about Sean and his career, about his his goals and ambitions as a photographer, how he's gotten to where he is today, and uh, creative inspiration, just kind of wherever the show rolls itself to. And towards the end, we're gonna look at some of your fantastic work get to take a look at that on the screen and you can tell us a bit of the backstories behind it, some technical aspects. I think a lot of our audience tends to be quite technical, so it's fun to get into some of the nitty gritty of what it took to make that image. And, and, I'll, and I'll poke and prod you for all that. And, and if I don't remember, I'll make it up. Th that works perfectly well as well. <laughs> Making it up is always good. All right, well, let's, uh, let's just get this thing rolling here. We are live on Facebook for those who are watching live and we have the ability to, to see your questions. So if you post any questions or any comments in there, we will get to them. We're not gonna uh, monitor it 100% of the time, I will keep glancing back at it and at appropriate times, we'll take a little break, see if there's any good questions and uh, and, th and try and answer them. So by all means, if there's something you want to know from Sean directly, pop it in there and we will get to it as soon as we can. Sound fair? Sounds great. All right. So again, Sean, welcome. Thank my, you. To my wee little show. Yes, thank you. It's good to be here. Um, I love your wee little show and I, <laughs> I love your uh, studio. My, my wee little studio. It's, yeah. It needs to be about twice as big to be a bit more comfortable, but yeah, we're good. That's yeah. great. We, we make do. We make do. <laughs> that it is. So uh, let's start with some real, real basics. How old were you when you first got into photography? Is this like a childhood thing or something you came into as an adult? And if it's an adult, you don't have to tell how old you actually were. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, a lot of people would not say I've reached adulthood yet. Fair enough. Fair enough. <laughs> but uh, no, I, you know, I was like a lot of kids. Probably I got some little like Kodak Instamatic camera for my birthday, probably when I was about 10 or 12 or something like that. And I don't know that that really set me, that, nah, that probably wasn't the defining moment, but I do remember as a kid having that little camera and running around taking some photos, but okay. really more just felt like you know made you feel like an adult because you had a camera or right 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 uh but what really got me into photography was in college uh i was my, my kind of my extracurricular activities in college which a lot of times took more focus than the actual studies hey, that's what makes college interesting <laughs> yeah exactly yeah so it was a lot of rock climbing cool. uh and mountaineering and also mountain biking, kayaking, backpacking, all that kind of stuff. Um, and I started taking photographs at that age um, to document those things because okay. it was fun. Uh, other people were interested to know what we were doing. And I found I enjoyed sharing it and sharing it through photos as opposed to just trying to explain it to them. Sure. Um, and now by sharing, we're not talking about Facebook sharing. This is a predates the, the yes. social media a little bit. Er, early 90s, almost predates the, the internet entirely. There you um, go. Oh. So yeah, early 90s. And so yeah, this was film, uh, slide film. We would give slide shows with the slides and the carousel, nice. that, whole, that whole thing, old school style. Do you remember what you were shooting with back then? So at that point, I was not a photographer. Sure. So I had no idea about photography itself or equipment or anything. So what I had was the smallest, cheapest, instant kind of point and shoot camera okay. that I could carry that would clip onto my harness mm. or, you know, sit, go in my pocket or whatever. So it was a little tiny uh, Olympus fixed focal length, you okay. know, lens, sure. Olympus, little sliding door <laughs> and one button. And nice. that was it. Nice. So that, that was it. Um, but yeah, you know, I took it everywhere. You could just pull it up one hand and snap off shots. You had no control over any settings or anything, but I'd put Fuji Velvia slide yeah. film in there. So I'd get these nice, really saturated, um, you know, slides and yeah. then project them and they'd look pretty good, I thought at the time. Sure. So, Do you still have any of those old slides? I do, I do. I have them all oh, actually, wow. um, but they haven't been viewed for years. Have you digitized them or are they just, just the slides? You know, early on, I did. So I got a few of them scanned and um, even early was using them in some of my slide presentations and things once I was kind of in that transition time okay. from, from film to digital. Uh, but quickly, it didn't take very long before even the scanned and even, you know, scan the slide and then do some more work in post in Photoshop or whatever on the scanned file. But quickly, those 35 millimeter 
slide images just did not stand up to the to the digital images. Sure. And so I, I really don't show them anymore. <laughs> <laughs> no, fair enough. So then, okay, so you're shooting just a document just because you're out with your friends yes. out doing all these wonderful outdoor things. Yeah. And at some point you go, yeah, I kind of like this photography thing. Yeah. I mean, I think it was one of those things where it gave you, me something else to do, <laughs> you know, because there's lots of uh, cold, boring, slow, um, painful, tiring moments in those kind of uh, activities. And okay. so being able to pass the time with looking through the lens and thinking about photos kind of gave me one more thing to take my mind off all the other stuff that was going on. Okay. So that was good. But then what I noticed was that, you know, you'd get back all the slides and you'd look at these hundreds of images you'd taken from a trip or whatever. And then you even give a slideshow, let's say maybe narrowed it down to 50 or 100 images. And there was always one or two that kind of stood out from the rest, as something more than just documentation. Nothing intentional, but people would comment on it like, oh, I really liked that one mm. and this one. And it was always kind of these same images. And so I started wondering, okay, so what are the qualities of those particular images okay. that make them stand out in this way that's more than just documentary? Uh, and once I can kind of identify those qualities of, you know, what is it about those particular images, then how can I recreate that more often? How mm -hmm. can I actually go out with the intention of doing that on a more regular basis as opposed to just, you know, just law of averages, you know, every once in a while you get lucky. Right, right, yeah. right. Okay. So you started asking yourself that. Did you find, was it pretty easy to figure out what that was or did that take a long time to identify what was making those images unique? Uh, I am still figuring that out. <laughs> that's a, I think that I hope, hopefully that's a lifelong pursuit. Sure. Um, you know, there were a few simple, obvious things, I think, that um, that came out f fairly quickly, became apparent to me. A lot of other things I noticed and learned by reading the writings of other photographers, better and more experienced than, than myself, and studying the photography from other photographers, especially landscape photographers that I really admired. Um, and that's part of what that did. The more I got into the photography, then the more I also got into being interested in photography as a, as a spectator and as an art appreciator okay, sure. as well. So then I started really looking at other people's work. Uh, and then when finally when digital came along, then it was a lot of trial and error because I really went to digital cameras towards the front end of that technology. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. So when it was, uh, that was a big advantage for me because when I started, there weren't really any rules about how to do it. You know, there were lots of books and workshops and lessons on film photography, mm -hmm. but digital was kind of this figure it out sort of uh, wild west frontier. Exactly. Yeah. So that was a lot of fun. And, and I really enjoyed that process of sharing with other people and, hey, what, you know, have you tried, if you do this, what do you think about that? How's that look? Sure. You know, and people would say, yeah, good or no, don't do that. Again. <laughs> you know, that kind of stuff. So it was a great learning process. So do you remember roughly what year that would have been when you started getting it or even maybe the first year that you had a digital camera? Do you so remember? My first experience with a digital camera was 1999 and I was okay. doing an expedition to South America. Okay. Uh, we were climbing uh, on Aconcagua, which is a big mountain in South America. And we were two of us on the trip were teachers at the time middle school and elementary school teachers and part of the way we wrangled extra time off from work to go climb this mountain was that we would make it interactive with our students okay so this is 1999 we have this big huge brick of a satellite phone oh, wow <laughs> and a laptop and someone we you know procured this little digital camera again uh, it was like a one megapixel camera I think it was a Kodak maybe it had one button on it again okay um, and we were doing live posts from the mountain through this satellite phone uplink and we could write a blog daily wow. uh, we were posting like uh, vital statistics you know like heart rate okay. breathing various things temperature uh, altitude barometric pressure and our students were plotting all of that with us and we could upload little teeny like 100 or 200 pixel images through this super slow satellite uplink and post those as well and right then I was like oh my gosh okay so the ability to immediately take this image and sitting here in my tent at 18,000 feet <laughs> load it up on the laptop crop it size it do these things with it 
and then send it off through, you know, space. <laughs> Literally. To, yeah. <laughs> to the website. And my students can see it within seconds on the other side of the world in the Northern Hemisphere. And we're in the Southern Hemisphere. I was like, I'm sold. That's yeah. it. Digital. Even though that camera was crap and it sure. you couldn't do much. But that was the moment I thought, yeah, this is where I'm going with it. Because I had had a lot of frustrations with as a film photographer, actually. Okay. Such as? Never getting the images to look like how I wanted them to look, always being disappointed when the when the film came back from the developing. Were you always shooting chromes or did you start shooting negative at some point? No, you know, I never, well, except for when I was the kid with the little sure. point and shoot. Uh, but no, I, um, cause I always wanted to give slideshows. That was my, always my thing. Uh, and uh, also my, my, kind of ghost mentors in photography. So Art Wolf, Galen Rowell, those guys all shot Fuji Velvia slide film. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, if they do it, that's what I got. Right, do. right. So, so no, I never shot uh, negatives. It's interesting. I remember when I was shooting film, I loved shooting Chrome as well. And a big part of the reason I loved Chrome was because I didn't have to go into the dark room. I never enjoyed the dark room. Right. Uh, black and white, obviously, you can do with your hands in the chemicals. When you're doing color, it's just a machine. Yeah. You're dialing numbers in the machine. I had zero joy in that. Right. And so shooting Chrome meant that I didn't have to do that. Right. And right. then if you wanted to print, you still send it off the lab and you exactly. could make Siva Chrome beautiful prints and yeah. they were fantastic. Yeah. So it's interesting that you had that uh, that transition, that experience. Yeah. Well, and I was definitely, but never I never got to mess around with one of those developer, you know, developing machines to develop my own color stuff. but. Um, but I did know somehow intuitively at that time that I didn't like being removed from that part of the process. Okay. You know, I liked the creative process involved in taking the photo and being there and, you know, composing it and thinking about light and subject and all of those things. But then the idea that that I was done and it was going off in some machine or some other person or whatever. Right. And then I just get back the result. You get whatever you get. And you get what you yeah. get. Yeah. So for me, it was, um, again, digital was this like, wow, I, I get back control of that second part of the creative process, mm -hmm. you know, which is now that I've captured the raw materials, being able to have some some input on what what do you do with those and how do you make, how do you convey the final sure. final idea? Okay. So you're, I see at that point, 99, Photoshop was, was well underway. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know what version number it would have been, but I know I was playing with version one in the early 90s, mid, or early to mid 90s. It so was, was pre-CS, but oh, yeah, yeah probably four or five, I would say, maybe yeah. somewhere six. So um, did you, once you started seeing digital, what you could do with a digital camera, or even in the earliest days when it was just crap, but it was something digital, at what point did you start taking these into Photoshop, find out about Photoshop, start using that and go, hold on, now I can do something really interesting with the images? So I think my first kind of, it was still a consumer cam camera, but it was my first digital camera that I owned mm -hmm. was a Canon, Power shot something sure. it was the very okay. first one. Okay, wow. Uh, and it was, I think, maybe like three or four megapixels. Had manual controls. Um, actually, had some decent resolution and and some fairly nice images at the time. You know, all, you could see the potential there. Though. Sure. So I had that camera, and I had a couple of those kind of still, you know, single lens. They had zooms on them at least, okay. and you know, manual controls. So I had a couple of those, and then. Um, Eventually, it was only a year or two after that. So maybe around 2001, 2002, I want to say, is when the Canon, um, see, was the 10D. Okay, sure. Came out. Uh, and that camera was a six megapixel SLR, um, not a full frame sensor, but a bigger sensor. And uh, I got that camera, and that's when it really started to feel like, okay, you know, I'm working with raw files. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, that's when the ability to really start working with the data and developing using Photoshop and the other tools. Okay. So let's let's talk about, well, I want to get into the Photoshop part of it because that's obviously a huge part of what you do. Sure. Um, maybe before we get into that, let's talk about the the actual images, what you're shooting, the landscape. So you obviously started with the, the outdoor stuff because that's what you were doing. Yeah. And at least from what I see of your work now, there's I'm not seeing kayaking in action sports, I'm seeing landscapes, yeah. beautiful vistas, that perfect moment landscape. At what point did you, as you're evolving here, did you go, okay, this is this is where I'm going to focus. This landscape stuff, people are responding to it, maybe you're selling it. Somewhere along the way you go, this is what I got to focus on. When when do you think that happened? Well, you know, it, it, was, it was an evolution. Um, 
But I think it probably can. I mean, the reason I was photographing those kinds of things, because those are the activities I was doing anyway. Sure. And so I was there participating in the activity and then trying to photograph it as I was participating. Um, and I think I started moving away from that once I started getting more serious and realizing, you know, I want to really make this a craft and put in the time and the effort and the energy. Uh, and I'm not a very good multitasker. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, for me to do that meant, you know, really no longer being able to participate in that activity. Okay. Uh, so that means now I'm out not climbing or not mountain biking. I'm just hanging around with a camera watching other people do it. And um, that's also really not my style so much. Right. Um, you know, I like to be immersed and involved in whatever it is. And so that's where the landscape photography really spoke to me because I could be out being a landscape photographer, that was the activity. You know, mm. I'm not dependent on anybody else doing anything or making sure I'm there when the event's happening or okay. lining up people and models or whatever. It's like, I can just head out with my camera and now instead of me being a climber or a biker, I'm a photographer and I'm just gonna go out and see what's out in the world. Okay. And also the other piece of that is that's really a, a place where I find a lot of, um, you know, a lot of my my core of who I am and what makes me feel good is being outside. And that's why I did these out, and I still do these outside athletic sure. type things is for those outdoor experiences. But to be out and, you know, witnessing the landscape and light and weather and, you know, geometrics as you hike and how things line up differently and, um, you know, perspectives and all that. And really with a camera being in tune to all of those things and then figuring out how can I capture this in a way of all these, this experience that I'm having to then hopefully communicate some piece of that back to other people who weren't there, who sure. didn't have that experience. So at some point in capturing those, you must have realized, okay, what I'm capturing is not necessarily what I'm seeing, is not at least what I envision. The colors aren't there, the lighting's what I want. I saw light and shadow in the real world where it just isn't showing up on the picture and enter Photoshop. And so today you're extremely adept at Photoshop. You do incredible things with it. Obviously that didn't happen overnight. So how did that progression evolve from where you saw the pictures that you were getting on camera and went, okay, it's a start, but this still isn't where I wanna be moving into Photoshop and take him to that next level. Yeah, uh, pretty early on, like I said, uh, pretty much as soon as I started getting my own digital cameras, really, I, I wasn't doing that with film and scan. I know there were people, you know, shooting film, scanning their film sure. and working in Photoshop, like you said, early 90s. Um, so I never did that. But as soon as I had digital files in hand, uh, then I was looking for um, applications okay. that I could develop the images and quickly came to Photoshop. Sure. That was kind of pre Lightroom still at that sure. point. Um, there were a few other things out there, but I quickly saw that Photoshop, even though it was complex and, you know, a big learning curve, but it really had uh, the tools and kind of this open ended format of there was no formula to it. There was no one click solutions, you know, just right. click that and it does something and you don't know what it did, but either you like it or you don't like it. Right. Uh, or there was no, I mean, you could use recipes or things, but you didn't have to. You could really like almost a painting, just kind of go where you wanted. And so I really enjoyed that. Just kind of, a lot of my early stuff was just experimenting mm -hmm. and it started, you know, very basic, you know, just the image. I wasn't even using layers or anything. It was just like making adjustments straight to the pixels mm -hmm. uh, and okay, brighter, darker, more contrast, less contrast more saturation, less saturation, you know, uh, cooler, warmer, those kinds of real basic things. Sure. And uh, yeah, just playing with it and turn out a lot of nut stuff that was really crappy, <laughs> <laughs> but having fun with it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay, so then your work has evolved into not just manipulating the layers, but going much deeper than that with the luminosity masks. I know for a lot of people who aren't familiar with the idea of luminosity masks, it's a pretty complex concept. Can you give a just a basic overview of what that is? And I know we'll, we'll talk about this more when you look at the pictures as well, but yeah. what is working with luminosity masks? What does that mean? Well, uh, so so this is a this is something that has been built into Photoshop since the beginning. In fact, it's part of the engine, the red, green, blue RGB engine of how uh, Photoshop works with images mm -hmm. and how it does color and brightness. Because really when you get down to it, any uh, group of pixels in a, in a digital image, there's really only two variables there. 
what color are the pixels, and how bright are they. Mm -hmm. And so um, most adjustments that you're doing are dealing with brightness or with color. So you can adjust all kinds of stuff lots of different ways in Photoshop. Um, and one of the ways that you can adjust and localize adjustments in Photoshop is with selections. So you can create a circular selection and then only adjust what's inside the circle and not adjust what's outside. But that's a hard edge selection. So you can see when you do that sort of a, a selection to make an adjustment to one part of the image, you see where the boundary is. Luminosity masks are based on the luminosity values in the image. So you're creating a selection, but depending on how bright or dark the pixels is, determines how much any one pixel is selected or not selected. So what this enables you to do in a very fine and precise way, with no visible edges or boundaries or anything like that, make adjustments based on luminosity. So I want to just adjust the brighter pixels, or I just want to adjust the darker pixels, or I just want to work in the mid-tones. Um, or even kind of targeting certain color ranges of luminosity because mm -hmm. there's a red channel, green channel, blue channel. So I just want to um, adjust the brighter tones in the red channel. So you can really then go in and do have this amazingly fine-tuned control over the luminosities and by that token, also the colors in your image mm -hmm. um, because the bright areas, if they have a lot of red and you work with the luminosity of those, you can also saturate the reds. And so you, you have this whole ax multiple axes of, of control that none of the other tools that are that are more obvious in Photoshop give you. In the, and then you're using the same other tools. You're still making you know levels adjustments or curves adjustments sure. or contrast adjustments or um, saturation adjustments, but you're targeting them by luminosity values. Right, which all the is, same tools. Yeah, with all the same tools. Yeah, it's no, it's, it's not like different Photoshop. Right. It's just how you control where your adjustments go. And, so, oh. so you've created, uh, you've worked with Tony Kuiper, I believe is his name, right? Yes. And you have, uh, between the two of you, you have a series of actions to facilitate selecting those luminosity masks, to, to create the masks, I should say, to select those luminosity regions and create the mask and then tutorials that you've created to go yeah. along with those. Yeah. So that where can people find those? Just quick plug for that because I know that's a big part of, of how you make your living is, is teaching, is education. Sure, yeah. So um, you can find them on my website, OutdoorExposurePhoto.com. They're on Tony Kuiper's website, which is goodlight.us. Okay. Goodlight.us. Uh, and yeah, so the panel, the the custom Photoshop panel, that's to, that's Tony's thing. He's the, the the brilliant mind behind that. He codes, programs, builds the panel. Uh, and then I provide the instructional content because it is a very robust, full featured, and it's something that has really come a long way over. In fact, he just had his 10 year anniversary from when he wrote. Oh, wow his first tutorial on how to do how to access luminosity masks in Photoshop and he posted it on a website 10 years ago called naturephotographers.net it's still out there MPN uh, and I think you may even be able to go back and find that original tutorial on the archives cool. anyway so it's been 10 years uh, and I provide the educational content because a lot of people get this and it's not intuitive and so they what do sure. we do so my videos say here's what you do with this tool tony Absolutely. makes the tool and here's how you use it um and yeah the reason why the tool is important because all of this is stuff that's built into photoshop but there's no icon or no button or no way to just say build me this right. luminosity mask and to build them by hand uh can be very multi-stepped and the reality is is that it's helpful as they are without tony's tool i would never spend the hours it would take to build a lot of these masks right. by hand. Tony's panel is all coded in. You say, I want this mask. You click the button for that mask. Boom, there it is. It's incredible. Yeah. Yeah, I remember because I, I did take a workshop with you up in Bend at some mm -hmm. point a couple years yeah. ago, and you showed a little bit of how to do it by hand. And it is like, just, it's incredible how complicated that can be. And then you yeah, have the one button. You're going, well, obviously, I'm going to buy yeah. this. Yeah, <laughs> that's the way Where's to the do one it. button to buy it? That's, <laughs> right. that's the one button I want to push right now. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, that's very cool. Let's talk a bit of business. So you make part of your living through education, making videos like these for Tony Kuiper, yep. uh, for his tools, and teaching workshops. Teaching classes, teaching workshops. And how, how many workshops a year do you do? You know, it it, it is varied. It started off uh, with just a couple, because I didn't know that that was something that I was going to be doing as a photographer. <laughs> I'd been a teacher in my previous career, and so when I started photography and people asked, are you going to teach photography? I said, sure. I, I've been a teacher for 12 years, you right. know, I'm moving on to something different. 
But uh, eventually, you know, people would ask, hey, would you teach us how to do these things that you're, you talk about doing? So eventually, I thought, oh, okay, well, let's try a class and I'll teach. Um, so, you know, it'd start off with a couple. And then I kind of connected with some other photographers who were leading workshops like in the field, you know, mm -hmm. not just classes in a classroom, but actually out in the field and going to locations around the Northwest. And, uh, you know, so coming along with them and doing workshops that way. And then that eventually even led to doing bigger tours, you know, where we go for a week or two weeks or even three weeks. I did a three week one in South, uh, South America wow. and Easter Island with, uh, with a colleague from Ben named Christian Hebe, who runs the Cascade Center of Photography. And so kind of peaked, I think, at doing maybe, I, I don't, I don't ever remember exactly, but maybe eight, 10, eight or 10 of them in a year, that's a lot. which is a lot. Although people who do only that, who are, you know, that's their main thing is workshops and tours, you know, might do 20 or 30 in a year, <laughs> you know, two or three times as much as I've done. Yeah. Uh, and it, it is a lot. Um, but now I, I did that for a long time and I'll still be doing that, but also I only have so much available time in my schedule. And uh, it's been it's been a few years bef since I've really taken personal trips or worked okay. on personal projects. Okay. So 2017, I have one big tour in Europe in in October hmm. uh, for two weeks in Slovenia and Croatia. Oh, and you do that. Part of the world I know that you know well. Absolutely. Because that's where you met uh, your wonderful that's wife. That's right. That's so cool. Yeah. I, that's, yeah, it's beautiful there. Yeah, I love it. I love it there. So we'll be going there and working with a, a Slovenian photographer, landscape photographer. His name is Luka Senko. Okay. And a great guy. He'll be working with us on that. He's the local knowledge. <laughs> right uh, and that's great. But that's my one for next year. Okay. Is and, that sold out or is there still space in that? You know, uh, Slovenia, it's two separate weeks, Slovenia and Croatia, or you can okay. do them both together because they, okay. they, 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 they mat, it works that they, they, complement each other. Uh, I think Slovenia is either full or close to full. Croatia may have a couple spots left in it. Um, and it's still almost a year out. So, sure. you know, things happen. And so if you're interested, if anybody's interested in that, stay tuned or uh, get in touch with me. It's going to be an amazing adventure. Is it on your website? It's on my website. Yeah. Cool. So website. we got that lower third down here somewhere there, right? There it is. <laughs> Outdoorexposurephoto.com. Go check that out. That's it. There you go. Yeah. Very good. Um, okay. So now education obviously is not the only thing that you do to make a living. You're also creating these images and where do the images go? Are they, they're licensed as prints. Are you selling prints online? Uh, where do the images themselves go to be a part of your bottom line? All of the above. All of the above. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so some of the my images that I feel are kind of somehow artistic worthy, art worthy. Yeah, I do sell prints, sign prints of all different sizes. And now we have so many different ways to create printed media, which I love. I love that. Uh, so that's, yeah, definitely sell prints. Sometimes I work through galleries and I've even done, um, you know, shows and exhibits and things like that. And that's one of those things that kind of ebbs and flows as well. Sure. Uh, and then a lot of commercial and editorial stuff. So okay. a lot of them end up, you know, publishing magazines, printed in calendars. Uh, a lot of stuff these days goes to website uh, website design, mm. um, advertising campaigns, marketing. Uh, and this is mostly licensing of existing images yes. you've already shot. Yes. Yeah, I used to, when I started my photography career, I would take any job that it had a camera and sure. paid something yeah. or even some that didn't pay, Yeah, yeah. <laughs> which was great. It was a really good experience. But um, over the years and as my business grew, uh, I learned what I liked, what I was good at, what I wanted to focus on and what things I let go. And the first thing that went was people photography, <laughs> um, you know, portraits and weddings and stuff. Not because I don't think it's, I think it's an amazing skill and art and beautiful work can be done. It's just not my skill set. Yeah. You know, every once in a while I'll get a okay shot of a person, but, uh, they're usually in a landscape. Is that so, well, <laughs> yeah, yeah, probably that's the, that's the best ones. But, I'm just, again, it's that multitasking thing because yeah. to be able to photograph a person, you have to run the camera and be creative and interface with the person you're photographing. Certainly. Unless you're doing total candid stuff. And for me, I was either chatting up the, the model and forgetting to take photos <laughs> or taking photos and the model saying, what am I supposed to be doing? Right. I'm getting no direction. Yeah, yeah. So I just realized that. So, uh, and then eventually things like, um, yeah, taking commercial assignments. I did that for a long time where people okay. would say, 
we want to hire you to go out and shoot this particular whatever mm -hmm. that we have that we need you to shoot. And um, again, that was great. And there are some people are really good at that because they enjoy, and I know you're this kind of person that enjoys. That's what I love, yeah. Yeah, kind of the engineering of the whole thing of like, okay, I've been given this puzzle mm -hmm. and a certain amount of time and a certain budget, and now I got to solve this puzzle within the parameters. Yep. For me, I hate that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I discovered, I learned that, yeah. is the idea that, um, okay, because clients would say, we love this photo of yours with this amazing light and this, you know, landscape or whatever. And that's the feel we're going for. So we want you to shoot that and you need to be uh, in this downtown parking lot at noon on Tuesday and you have an hour. <laughs> <laughs> and then the idea that somehow I'm supposed to create this thing that took me years and multiple tries and being out in the right place at the right time. And somehow I have to recreate that in a parking lot at noon, you know, so. <laughs> at noon, it's always going to yeah, be at noon. Yeah, right? always at noon. Yeah. <laughs> so that was, that was, uh, that was tricky. Got it. So, yeah. So eventually those kinds of things went away till nothing was left but the landscape okay. work. All and so everything I have, yeah, I don't shoot anything on assignment. It's like, I take it and if it's useful, let me know, and if it's not useful, it'll just sit there. <laughs> that's that's fantastic to have, to be at that place in your career, to be able to shoot that way, shoot only what you want to shoot, and make a living from doing that. That's incredible. So congratulations to you. Well, thank you. Yeah, I, I enjoy. It. I don't know how that works or worked, <laughs> but I'll, I'll, uh, it seems to be working. It so I'll go working. with it. I'm gonna there run with it. Fair enough. Well, I want to look at some pictures before we do. I see at least one question up here. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, Metacell, it looks like. It says, a question for Sean. How do you know when you're done editing, when to stop and not to do more edits? That is a great question. That is a good question. <laughs> and that, you know, that is something difficult that I do struggle with. And I think everyone does. Is like, how do you know what is your, you're going for? And mm -hmm. how do you know when you get there? And I think, again, so my friend Tony Kuiper, who is the technical guy behind is his panels with luminosity mass but he also is an amazing artist and and photographer as well and this is something i think i was doing already but he kind of formalized it and put it into words for me and then i've tried to share that with other people is the idea of asking one simple question as you're as you're editing or, or developing is what does the image need now or next so i look at the image and think okay it feels totally a little out of balance you know this too bright here, too dark here. So that's one thing. I'm going to address that and see if I can work with that. Okay, you know, I feel good about that. Now, what does the image need? Take it again. Uh, you know, maybe I need to clean up the edges or maybe I need to clone out some dust spots or maybe I need to work contrast or maybe, and then it starts getting down to these little, well, that one, air, that flower is oversaturated, mm -hmm. pull back the saturation on just that flower or, you know, those kind of little things. But at some point you get to a place where what does the image need next? And you look at it and go, I, I, I don't see anything I think it needs next. Okay. Uh, that doesn't mean that it doesn't need anything sure. or it doesn't mean that you haven't gone too far. And so the next piece of the process, once there's no, what does the image need next coming to me, I usually go away and leave it for a period of time, hours, days, weeks, okay. or years, a lot of times, um, or all the above. And a lot of times after that period of time away, you come back and then when you look immediately, things that you didn't notice before jump out and you think, well, what did I do? <laughs> or what did I not do yet? Sure. And so then you start the process again. Wow, it's, you know, it's got a really green color cast. I need to work with that, you know, that, that green is, I didn't notice it before, but now right. I can see it. Or it's too dark or it's too bright or um, I way oversaturated or whatever. And like I said, that's an ongoing process for me with a lot of my images. A lot of my images, you know, one that hasn't been used and I haven't really looked at for four or five years. And then all of a sudden somebody says, hey, we'd like to use this image. And I think, oh, I'm just gonna pull it off, you know, and just send it to them. And I look at it and think, what was I thinking five years ago? <laughs> redo, redo, redo before I send it out again. Sure, that's great. I think that's that's a really great approach to look at it. The what else does it need? What does it need? And then what have I done too much? It's it's easy to overdo it, and especially like you said, you're you don't notice until sometime later that it's got too much green or whatever it is. Right. You get so used to you're looking at that image. You, you could have a complete wrong white balance and white becomes that that orange becomes white becomes and in white, your mind yeah. it's white and until exactly. you look at something that you know is white it doesn't reset yeah and i i just saw something online the other day and i i, I didn't dare to actually look at it but it was a 
look at this video for a minute and you'll be colorblind for five minutes or something like that. And because I know that you can completely mess with your color perception. Mm -hmm, absolutely. And I, I don't know, I'm about to hit play on that thing. I don't want to mess with my color <laughs> perception. But if you, yeah, if you're looking at one image for so long, mm -hmm. your baseline for normal goes completely out the window. Exactly. Yeah, it's really important to step back. And that's a huge part of it, stepping back, coming back to the work later. Yep. Really, really important, no matter what you're doing, landscape or portraits or anything. Absolutely, yeah. Huge. And I will say also, um, getting feedback from other photographers is really helpful as well. And that's yeah. one of the great things that the internet has done because it's brought together the community of photographers. Everyone's connected and in reach with each other. And so the ability to have, you know, a, a group of Facebook friends or sure. a, a blog or a, a forum or somewhere that you can throw up a photo and say, hey folks, what do you think about this? And a lot of times they point out stuff that you mm -hmm. can see as well. So that's another important piece yeah. of the process. I do that not as much as I used to, um, but I still do, you know, if I'm really struggling with something, I'll put it out to other people. Sure. It, it, that's one thing that I've found, especially with the, the online community, photographers community, they're very nice to each other. It's, 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 it's a really good, warm community we can get a, be a part of and help each other out and learn from each other. Uh, not a whole lot of jealousy and animosity going on out there. And there's certainly it's there, but there's a lot of really good people, really good photographers who are really good people and love to share their opinions and share their education and right. and share their thought process. It's nice Absol to see. Absolutely, I agree, I agree. Um, that's what I say at a lot of my workshops when I get there, I say, all right, this is awesome because you, you guys are my people and now I get to spend the next however many days hanging out with other people who like what I like and yeah. you know, we all kind of speak that same language and have that same interest regardless of where we came from or yep. any, any other things, you know, we know we've got that. Absolutely. So that's great. Super. Well, with that, let's take a look at some images. You've got a quite a large collection here. I don't know if we're getting through all of them, but uh, let's see what we can do. Let's get out of the selection Ooh. mode. And we're going to start with that. Let's just bring it up and tell us what we're looking at here. Yeah. So um, I just thought I'd, I'd throw in a couple of shots that I had in there um, taken by other people I was out photographing with just so you can kind of see what, what does it look like, you know, being a photographer in the landscape. Um, you know, so this is in uh, South America in Torres del Paine National Park and along this raging um, river, you know, with all this glacial sediment in it. And the uh, Cornos del Paine in the in the background, there's just really incredible surreal mountains, and you know some of the positions that you end up getting into uh, to to take some of the photos, <laughs> yeah. and that's for me that's part of the fun too. Starting with that kind of outdoor adventure background, and there can be that element of that in the photography too, mm -hmm. you know, because sometimes you're hiking long distances or you're trying to access some precarious position that's, you know. Sure. on the edge of a river at the top of a cliff or on a mountain or, you know, up on a tree or wherever. So yep. that's a lot of fun. Good. And here's another, there's another one. This is in the Vir <laughs> Virgin River Narrows um, in Zion National Park. And again, just, you know, wading out into the water and standing there and setting up the tripod because as you can see, well, the light that's kind of right in front of me that's reflecting on the water. Mm -hmm. It's like, that's the only place, that's where you have to stand to put that light in the, in the foreground of the scene. Right. I think we can... Yeah, we can pinch yeah, in. Yeah, so on you can that. see that great. That's reflecting from the canyon walls, you know, a thousand feet above. Wow. Um, but it's like, boy, I, I, that really draws me that that color and that mm -hmm. light and that that quality. Where do I have to put my camera in order to get it in the photo? <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Right on. Hey, there's another question come up. Let's jump to that real quick. Um, looking at, let's see, Sean Mark Nipper. Hello, Sean. He says, "How long hey, do you Mark. prep for a sunrise shoot? How early do you usually get set up?" And how do you pass the time while waiting? <laughs> <laughs> so, how long? Angry are, birds, no. <laughs> yeah. Well, how, the planning or prepping goes kind of, it can run the gamut. Um, I, you know, I have a very minimal kit. You know, not a studio photographer. I know if, if you go out into <laughs> Joseph's big studio, he just has mountains of gear and everything that you need for studio photography, plus also broadcasting like this. Yeah. Everything I have fits in a nice little backpack, you know, a couple camera bodies, three, four, five lenses, a couple filters, tripod, and that's all I need. It's always packed and ready to go. So uh, whether I'm out on a trip or at home, I can be out the door in minutes, okay. however long it takes me to throw on some pants and suck down some coffee and I'm out the door. <laughs> so around here, a lot of times at home, or even if I'm out on a trip, it's a matter of getting up and looking out the window and 
deciding, you know, am I, what am I going to go out? Right. And I have no idea. Or even maybe it doesn't look good. I'm going to go out anyway. We had that experience just a couple days ago. Yeah. We, we headed out before sunrise and thought, it doesn't look like it's going to do anything, but let's go out anyway. And then it was this amazing sunrise, but it just as easily yeah. might not have been. And it was very brief. Once and, that sunrise yeah. was over, it was, that was it. Yeah. And then the rest of the morning was just driving yep. around and, <laughs> you know. Yeah, yep. shoot the breeze, which was also good. But uh, but other times, you know, if I'm in, in some place that I'm not familiar with or some place where I've got, you know, I'm not going to be there a long time or it's a difficult place to get to or it's a really critical shot, like the shot needs a certain thing. And I want to, you can never in landscape photography be 100% sure of anything. And mm -hmm. that's another part that's kind of fun that I like about it is that you just have to take what you get. Uh, but you can stack the odds in your favor more. And so research and prep and knowing, you know, where you want to be at what time and where the sun's going to come from and what kind of weather pattern and what time of year, uh, that kind of stuff might uh, be able to help you out. So sometimes I do more prep than others, especially if I'm going to be flying somewhere I've never been before and sure. I've got, I'm going to be there for a day or two or three or whatever. I really want to make sure I've done my research. Yeah. Let me see. Enough. I want to look at the other questions there. Got to pull down my old man glasses. Um, <laughs> How early do you usually get? Oh, shut up? yeah. So that's another thing that really varies. You know, time of year, location on the planet, what the subject matter is. So if you're shooting sunrise um, in Alaska or Norway in June, you're basically shooting sunrise all night long. You know, because it's the land of the midnight sun. The sun essentially yeah. doesn't set or barely sets. And you're going to get that sunrise kind of light at, you know, midnight. So that's when Fabulous. you're out there. Yeah. Most of the time, you know, again, summertime, though, even here, like Oregon, we're fairly northern latitude, but not, you know, we're close to 45 degrees. But sunrise in the summer is 530. And the good twilight light that comes before the actual sun pops over the horizon is a half an hour before that. So that let's put the question that way. If you're looking at the sunrise clock and it says sunrise is 530 a.m., what does that mean to a landscape photographer? Is that sun, you need to be ready to push the button at 5.30 or you're packing up by 5.30 or you're starting to set up at 5.30? What right. does that mean? So so the sunrise time that you get, you can look up the sunrise and now with you know phone apps, you can get the sunrise wherever location you are. Yeah. You just say, I'm here. What's the sunrise here? Exactly. But that time is, imagine if, if everywhere was like a flat desert or the ocean. There is a there is a, a neutral horizon that's you know kind of the sea level horizon, so the sunrise time is the time that the sun would rise above that. Okay. You know the sun's peeking up over that horizon, that flat horizon. Um, but if you're in the mountains and you're down deep in a canyon, there's a mountain towering thousands of feet above you. Even though sunrise is at 5:30, the sun may not actually crest the mountain till 11 o'clock. Sure. And, you know, it might be four hours later. So, um, oh no, that would be six hours. Anyway. Ah, a long time later. <laughs> a long time later. Yeah. So, so it's dependent on the topography around you. Um, and there's this whole thing of twilight. So the actual sunrise is when the sun's coming over the horizon. And if you're in a place where you can see the horizon, that's great. Uh, but I really like the light starting 30, 40 minutes before sunrise. And that's when you get a lot of those great colors in the sky. The landscape's still very dark. Then right at sunrise, it can be nice because that's when that first low angle filtered light is just skimming the tops of things. And then up until usually I find uh, half an hour to 45 minutes or an hour after sunrise, you still have um, daylight, but low angle daylight, long shadows, side lighting, that kind of stuff. Um, so yeah, so my, my shooting period for sunrise or sunset is usually from half an hour or more before sunrise until maybe an hour or so after sunrise. And then you've got to be in position before that. So if I want to shoot at sunrise is 530, I want to shoot at five. I want to be there probably 445 or 430 because I got to set up and get things where it's going to go and the right lens on the camera. And you know, if it's a one hour hike to that location, then I'm leaving at 330 from the trailhead. Mm -hmm. And if I was camped, an hour down the road, then I'm getting up at 2.30 to, you know, so it's kind of a do the math backwards. Yeah, yeah. It's a landscape photography, not a job for somebody who doesn't like mornings. Yeah, <laughs> exactly, yeah. Drink a lot of coffee on the yep. And what about sunset? Same same thing, just in reverse? Same thing in reverse. Yep. Um, so, yeah, 
the nice thing about sunset is that you get to set up in the light <laughs> and you get to see what it is that you're shooting and yeah. then the light comes which can be great um sometimes i find uh sunset shooting a little more challenging though usually at the end of the day the earth is warmed up you get uh, more air currents and things going mm -hmm. so you'll have a lot more motion ripples on water you know if you want a nice reflection sunset's going to be harder to get that not impossible okay. uh tree branches moving grass blowing flowers moving around okay uh, so there's some challenges there um and obviously depending on where you are there's going to be a much more human activity right at sunset than at, you know sunrise you can be out be by yourself and at sunset you often have a big crowd of your you know some of your closest friends all around <laughs> you so uh, getting in your shot and all kinds of other super things. yeah absolutely good right well thank you good i'm glad you asked that question sean this is a thanks sean. good way to evolve into that so let's uh let's pull up some more pictures here sure so i thought i'd start off just kind of um these aren't photos from the beginning of my career but maybe kind of the, the kind of photos that uh you know kind of general landscape photos where my interest started um, you know, so this is a, you know, a canyon landscape, um, some nice lights, some beautiful rocks, a twisting river, uh, a lot of landscape photography kind of revolves around the idea of simplifying the composition, turning something three-dimensional into something two-dimensional, um, using leading lines and curves and various diagonals and things like that, plus light to create dimension and depth and draw you into the scene. So, and then part of the fun with landscape photography is trying to find out where these places are, because not every place is good for, you know, it, sure. it lines up well. And where is this? This is Oregon, isn't it? This is extreme Northeastern Oregon, yeah. almost in Idaho and almost in Washington. Okay. And this is the Imnaha River Canyon, which is this really beautiful, amazing canyon. It's the canyon next to the um, Hell's River Canyon, okay, uh, you know, which is the Snake River, which is deeper than this canyon. But I think the Imnaha River Canyon is more dramatic because it's it tends to be a little tighter, a little more dramatic in terms of cliffs and and features. Yeah, it's incredible. Yeah. So now to get to this location, is this a drive up to location? Is this a a hike to? This is a, a drive to hike to. Okay. So first <laughs> of all, the closest town of any size to here is Joseph. Uh, Oregon. Yeah, I like that place. That yeah. sounds like a good, good a, town. It's, uh, yeah. Um, I think there's a statue of you when you <laughs> enter the... No. You're pointing in the distance. No. Um, that's actually named after Chief Joseph of the Nez Perce Indian tribe. Oh, okay. Yeah. Cool. Uh, anyway, you go there, then you drive, I don't know, uh, down some windy paved roads into the Imnaha Canyon to a little tiny town, like one store town called Imnaha on okay. the bottom of the canyon. And then from there you jump on a dirt road and drive north for about 20 miles on four wheel drive kind of Jeep roads, uh, which can be pretty good to really bad depending mm -hmm. on when, you know what the conditions are. And then you finally reach a point where you stop and then you get off and you don't have to hike far, but then you do a bit of a hike to get to the edge of the canyon to get this viewpoint. That's incredible. Absolutely gorgeous. So a couple more. Should, should yeah, I go keep ahead, going? Go okay. Ahead, yeah. So so you know uh, just general kind of landscape. A lot of my landscape photography is about color and light. You know so wild you know wildflowers, sunsets, cool lighting, beautiful sublime kind of yeah. scenes. So there's that. Of course sunrises and sunsets we've been talking about. That's when you get this amazing light show of color. Uh, that's nature's light show. And to be out capturing that, I think is just wonderful. You know, try, try to create a lighting scenario like that in the studio. I'm not saying it couldn't be done. <laughs> challenge but, accepted. Yeah, challenge accepted, <laughs> yeah. But nature, you know, you have to, you have to um, wait for it. But when it does it, it does an amazing job. It does. Okay, so an image like this, I think this mm -hmm. is a good example of luminosity masking. Sure. It? Where there's a lot happening here that you wouldn't necessarily see with the naked eye or you certainly wouldn't see with a straight photo. Right. So tell us a little bit about what went into this image. So, yeah, so this is an example of what's called uh, high dynamic range or extended dynamic range lighting. Mm -hmm. And basically what that is, is, you know, any camera can capture a certain contrast range from the darkest dark to the lightest light value in the scene and fit it within one image. But every camera has some outer edge of sure. that and they keep getting better so the that range gets bigger and bigger all the time but you still in nature can easily surpass that range right. so when that happens you're out of luck in terms of getting it in one 
exposure because no matter what you do, you're either going to blow out your highlights and show what the shadows look like, or you're going to show what the highlights look like and block up your shadows and have black shadows, uh, or do both, blow out your highlights and your right. shadows at the same time. Um, so you can either use some sort of like a graduated filter to try to balance the light that's coming into the camera. So hold back the bright areas mm -hmm. and let through the light in the in the darker areas. But that only you know really works because if you have a straight line, like this scene wouldn't work too badly because you do have kind of a straight line between the bright and the dark, although you do have this bright reflection down right. below. Oh, yeah. So that creates some challenges with filters. So the next step is then bracket multiple exposures in the camera, expose for all the different light values in the scene, all the different tonal areas, uh, and then use, well, there's lots of different ways to bring those exposures together later. There's automated software. Um, I do it all by hand in Photoshop with layers and layer masking and you know all types of ways of masking, freehand masking, using selections that I've created, you know, using selection tools and also luminosity mass. And the luminosity mass, a great uh, example of where that would be really helpful is in this image, the uh, the bright light coming through those tree branches. Okay. So you see the, the aspen trees, yeah. And the bright light that's behind it. So those trees are dark. Mm -hmm. The sky is very bright. So in one exposure, the trees are almost black and the sky is the orange color. In another exposure, the sky is white and the trees are the tree color. And so how to bring that together. Now, you could go in, I guess, by hand and try to select every, <laughs> you know, around every little branch yeah, and right. leaf. But a luminosity selection will already do that for you because you can say, I want to select the bright areas between the leaves and branches and not select the leaves and the branches themselves and then use that to bring the two together. And not only behind the trees, but also in the reflections. In the it's reflection, the same thing. yeah, everywhere. Yeah, that's yeah. incredible. Yeah. And that's, yeah, that's where the luminosity masking really comes into play. It does, Just yeah. doing that by hand would be insane. Yep. Yeah, yeah. right on. So, let's see what else. Oh, and here's another, so this is a seascape. You know, grand landscapes, I love it. You mm -hmm. know, drama in nature, amazing. You know, the, we live in a, a really amazing and diverse and varied world. And in addition to all the various landscapes, every weather and lighting condition changes the landscape yep. and so it's really fun to be out there shooting that um more and more though you know i like i'll shoot a grand landscape like this anytime mm -hmm. but more and more i uh i'm looking for ways to tell stories in my photos uh. so for example you know this is the ocean not much of a story there it's beautiful to look at i think and it tells a little bit of story about uh, you know, the motion and the light and the color and the time of day mm -hmm. and that kind of stuff. Maybe you, you can imagine about where on the planet it might be. But now you take a, an image with a, with a moody sky and you throw a lighthouse in, uh, you know, yeah. on, on kind of looking over the scene. And now all of a sudden it tells more of a story about, um, you know, maybe... The, who, where is this place? Who are the people who live in that lighthouse? Mm -hmm. What is that lighthouse there for? Do ships come through here? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, what's the history of maritime activity? Um, so, you know, creates some more story. Sure, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, or is still in the landscape, but now, if like this image, abstract pattern, you know, almost like mm. ink blot with this reflection <laughs> and just the way the clouds were and the way they were repeating patterns going either direction. Um, and, and the lines of cloud also kind of mirroring the lines of trees. And, you know, so you've got the blue yellow thing. So not so much um, literal story, but mm -hmm. kind of uh, visual and conceptual story sure. more than just a landscape. You can see other things in it. Absolutely. So I like that kind of hold there. Yeah, here, let's let's go back to here. We've got a few questions that have oh, come yeah. up. Uh, yeah, so Robin uh, Grokjan, I think it's uh, how that's pronounced, is how do you deal with fast moving clouds in a high dynamic range situation? When you take multiple images, they won't line up perfectly, making it difficult to apply blending techniques. It is a challenge and a couple different possible uh, approaches. Okay. One is, is if the dynamic range in the sky is all in one exposure value, mm -hmm. It could be different than the land or other parts of the image. You'll have to bracket for that. But as long as the sky is all in one exposure, then you only need one sky exposure. And that, you know, takes care of that problem. Right. The other way to go is, you know, I do manual bracketing uh, mostly in my imagery because uh, <laughs> trying to do the auto bracketing that your camera can do to figure out, you know, how many 
brackets do I need? How far apart do they need to be? You know, and get that all predicted and set up in your camera ahead of time. So when you press the button, the camera does what you want it to do and you actually get what you want. I find I have better success rate when I just control it. It's a little slower, a little more cumbersome. I got to adjust between mm -hmm. each photo, but I always know at the end I got exactly what I wanted. The time when I, times when I don't do that is if I have like fast moving clouds um, to set auto bracket and, and, and the sky is not all one exposure. You've got, let's say, dark cloud with a light beam coming through. Okay, sure. And so there's dynamic range in the sky itself. Um, then to be able to fire off, bam, bam, bam you know, three, four exposures, one right after the other, there's still going to be some movement depending on how fast those clouds are traveling. Right. Um, but if you at least get them closer, then you can uh, maybe shift the layers slightly. Okay. Uh, the other thing is nice is that things that move that are kind of soft, like clouds or water, you have some fudge room. Sure. That, you know, it's not like the edge of a tree branch where if it moves a centimeter, you can see right, right, that right. they don't line up. Clouds a little bit of motion because they're soft and puffy, and water, if it's flowing, is is soft. So right, absolutely. Uh, let's talk about the manual bracketing just momentarily. So that's something that that I learned from you when we were up in Bend. Right. And for the most part, in my experience of doing any kind of high dynamic range, whether you're creating an HDR, or you're going to try and blend something manually. You, like you said, you set your camera to shoot three exposures of five or seven, and they're a third of a stop apart or a stop apart or whatever it is, and brrr, you get the the shot of them. Right. But then you showed me that you don't need all of those you if you have three things that you're trying to expose for you have your sky you've got the mountain range you've got the trees set an exposure for each one of those and it might be one exposure is two and a half stops off from another one and the other one is only one and a third stop and that's fine and that's because you're manually blending and it doesn't matter exactly but if you throw those into an hdr app it yeah. gets a bit confused it doesn't it, know how to handle it that. wants nice even increments in, right. in, the, in the exposures yeah but yeah so that's very true if you're manually bracketing uh and so in addition to being able to focus on different tonal or, or luminosity areas within the image and just get those areas exposed for properly uh is is handy the other thing is that just because it's high dynamic range light, it's outside the range of a single exposure in your camera, doesn't mean it's nine exposures. Sure. Sometimes a high dynamic range image, the whole scene is encompassed just in two exposures, or three, or five, or you know, in real extreme situations, you know, nine stops or whatever. But again, doing it manually, if you need one exposure, you take it, you look at the histogram, oh, it all fits, done. Right. It didn't quite fit, bracket, Take another one. Oh, it fits in two. Mm -hmm. Done. No, it didn't quite fit in two. Three. Done. Uh, as opposed to, you know, I, I'm out. I'll be out shooting in various places where there's other photographers around, and I'll see somebody, and they have their camera set to bracket nine stops, nine exposures, and they're just everything. Nine shots. Bam, 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 bam. And we're shooting in the fog. It's not even a high <laughs> dynamic range scene, and they're just wanting to be sure bracketing right, nine right. shots for everything. I don't want to mess with that. Yeah, yeah, good, good. That's, that's an important point because I think a lot of people who are especially new to this idea of high dynamic range photography, whether you're making the traditional HDR image or not, have this idea that you got to just bracket the heck out of it and go the full range and, and they, they have to be even, but if you're manually doing it, it doesn't. So right, that's yeah. good. So thanks. Yeah, as for long it. as you get the right exposure for all the different luminosity values and you've got some overlap mm -hmm. between the exposures. Then that's all you need. That's all you need. Super. All right, we got another one here. Sebastian Kraus says, uh, do you make do you make shoot any and say, let's fix it in Photoshop or is it quite the opposite? Many photographers say that uh, it's not, not the camera making the photo, but the photographer, of course. However, what's your opinion about high tech retouching software? Well, I think Sebastian, we've been, we've been talking quite a bit about how much retouching goes on. And most of the images that Sean's creating are not straight out of the camera. Uh, there is a lot of work that's going on there. Right. Um, I don't know if you want to add to it. I think it seems like maybe Sebastian did miss the first part of our, our video. No, it's okay. Cause I think that is an important distinction to make is uh, I'm, you know, I'm trying to recreate the image as either it appeared to me or as my imagination, you know, experienced it as I was standing there. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm never, you know, I know lots of people who can create something out of whole cloth or start with some very uh, limited starting materials and create something amazing from it. For me, I want maximum quality and I'm always working with what was actually there. Mm -hmm. So I'm never in a place where I'm shooting and there's a, no sunrise. I'm like, don't worry, I'll put in a sunrise <laughs> later. You know, there's no, you know, or, you know, I'm shooting in the summer and I'm like, don't worry, I'll make it look like fall later. I'm never doing that. Okay. 
I mean, I'm not saying you can't do that or you shouldn't do that or that I wouldn't if I had the skill, but I'm saying uh, I'm starting, I mean, with what I experienced and then how can, what do I need to do to the image to communicate that to the viewers who weren't there. Mm -hmm. And as it came, if it comes out of my camera and doesn't communicate that, then it's not a successful image yet. And once it communicates that, regardless of what I did, whether it was just a couple of quick levels adjustments or whether it was exposure blending and lots and lots and hours and hours of work mm -hmm. to get it to the point where someone else could look at the image and go, wow, it's almost like I know what it was like to be there. Sure, sure, got it, perfect, all righty. That's that for the comment. Let's go ahead and switch to another picture here. Okay. Unlock this guy. Oop. And here we go. Yeah, wow. so talking about, you know, telling a story. And a lot of times it's about, um, well, actually, there are plenty of photographers, like yourself included, who could conceptualize this, I think, beforehand and, and set something like this up. I'm not one of those people. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, um, I love serendipity and coming across things in, uh, you know, in the landscape that make for an interesting photo. So there's a million photos of the beach. Mm -hmm. And there's probably not as many, but a lot of photos of the beach at night. You know, this is moonlight. But I'm walking along and someone has created this labyrinth in the beach at low tide by <laughs> scratching patterns in the sand. And there's enough moonlight and I'm like, oh, that, now that's something different. Sure. So I'm photographing it, but it doesn't really quite show up. So then I'm like, how can I really make this stand out? I wanna tell this story of this pattern this cool labyrinth pattern on this this beach in the nighttime. I know I'll walk the labyrinth with my headlamp or flashlight pointed at the ground. And so that's what I did. Um, took me about eight minutes to walk the whole thing. <laughs> so every, every time I did it, it was eight minute exposure. Wow. And I messed it up the first four or five times, got off <laughs> off track and oh, lost okay. my way in, 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 the, in the labyrinth. So about an hour spent walking the labyrinth with my light before I finally nailed it. And the tide's coming in the whole time, oh, wow. which is, you know, <laughs> shortly after I finally nailed it, it was going to erase the whole It was wiped thing. out. Yeah. That's awesome. So Very cool. Keep moving. Sure. Uh, this yeah. is another example of telling a story. This is a story of a natural phenomenon, a lunar eclipse. Uh, but a lunar eclipse is a mini multiple hour event mm -hmm. and, you know, not really the, the territory of still photography usually, <laughs> you know? Um, and if I had tried to just leave the shutter open for seven hours, mm -hmm. you don't have a picture of the moon. You have a picture of a, a streak across the sky yeah, that gets absolutely. darker and then brighter again. Mm -hmm. But, uh, but that's it. So to see that time compressed, seven hours of time compressed into a single two-dimensional photograph, you photograph it all night long, you photograph all the different phases of the moon, then you photograph a background shot, you photograph the star field when it's totally dark, sure. you photograph the early twilight before sunrise coming up so you get some color, uh, orange color on the horizon, and then you composite all of those pieces together Incredible. Uh, to create a story about that lunar eclipse that there's you know couldn't be all in one photo otherwise. Sure. Fantastic, love it. That's one of my favorites. That's such a great image. That's fun. And this is also something you just can't go out and do every day. You no. get <laughs> on average any place on the Earth about one lunar eclipse per year. Okay, that's about how often lunar eclipses happen in any one part of the world. Uh, but is it going to be clear skies? Sure. And is it going to yeah. be a total lunar eclipse? Or you know, so so this is kind of fun because you can't just go do that any day. Right. Um, obviously, where you travel in the world can tell some great stories mm -hmm. through photography. So this is Easter Island, uh, Rapa Nui, the uh, famous Moai, ancient Moai statues that stand guard all around the island. Mm -hmm. And you know, shooting at daytime, you know, they're they're impressive and very interesting to photograph just as you know, historical pieces sure. and art pieces and all these various things. But there's also a certain kind of mystic mythology, I mean, behind this that people feel about things like this, ancient things. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to try to capture some of that. So this was nighttime, that's a full moon. And there's about a six or seven minute exposure. That's why the clouds are doing that cool streamy thing. That's, and you yeah, see that's some star so trails. Nice. And it just, I, I, I lined myself up in the shadow of that big Moai, uh, but I made sure that the moon was kind of on the edge so that towards the end of my seven minute exposure, the moon started peeking out and created the moon star. Okay, so you, t that's, right, so that's moving in reverse. It's not, 
you started behind her and just started to peek it out. Just was peeking out, and that's where you yeah. close the close yeah. the shutter. Yep. Oh, that's because great. if I had had the full moon in the frame for full seven minutes, that moon would have blown out that whole part of sky. Right. Or if I had been more in the shadow and the moon had never come out, you don't get the little star, the star you know, on the his starburst, head. Yeah. Yeah. So kind of timing it like where do I need to stand so I only get a little bit of the moon right at the end of the exposure. Cool. I didn't realize it was night until I saw the the stars stars up in the uh, up in the corner there. Yeah, yeah. The stars there I've given away I realized, oh wait a minute, this yeah. is a night shot. Yeah. That's so cool. And I think even maybe more fun on this, this mm. was my birthday. <laughs> <laughs> I just happened to be there nice. and this night with those clouds and the moon. It was it was a fun nice. fun way to spend my birthday. Very good. So um more and more in my landscape photography, I'm getting interested in the idea of simplification. And, and one of the ideas, this idea of kind of a monolith or a, mm -hmm. a, a mono subject, you know, something in the scene that's just one. Okay. So here it's this, it's actually two trees. These are the sentinel trees in the, in the, um, the uh, bristlecone pine forest in the high in the White Mountains, about 10,000 feet. Wow. And, not, uh, and there's two trees there, but I composed them so they look, they kind of melded into sure. one tree. So this idea of this monolith, this single kind of powerful thing. And then sometimes to have a counterpoint to the monolith, so just nice that the moon was there. Mm -hmm. And so that's this nice little delicate counterpoint to the monolith. Uh, here's a monolith. This is a mountain. Um, but again, because of the way the clouds and the reflection and my exposure, you get this kind of halo or you know, orange ring around this dark central pattern. Um, but again, the monolith, the single. Gorgeous, gorgeous. Uh, here, very, again, very simple. You've got the two stones, but creating this single stretch of, of white water as the mm -hmm. wave kind of came between them. And then just again, nice that uh, the sun as it's setting just perfectly centered itself sure. in line with that channel. Uh, here's a, a one, this one white piece of coral amongst all these black basalt rocks on this beach in Hawaii. But again, this, this one standing out from all these other things that are kind of similar in the background. Nice. And let's see. Yeah, and sandstone in, in the American Southwest, uh, a great, amazing uh, landscape, really lunar and otherworldly. And you add in this otherworldly twilight, mm -hmm. but uh, again, it's you're able to really simplify because all you have is stone and sky. Yeah, beautiful, wonderful. So, so those are some ideas that I like. Oh, and again, sea stacks can mm -hmm. create excellent kind of the idea of the monolith. This one's you're kind of looking through the channel to this this uh, you know A sea island. stack that's out there. Yeah, this kind of standing on its own outside, um, but then. Also throwing in some other elements. Those other ones have really just one element. This one's got the monolith, but then it's got this keyhole of light coming through in the foreground. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So this is almost like two elements now, kind of adding one more layer to it. Uh, here's two elements. So you got the monolith of the mountains, but then this arced cloud that also in the reflection makes this kind of fun C-shaped pattern. Very cool. Um, and yeah, I've seen lots of, I've photographed these mountains and seen these are very common place to photograph in, in the Canadian Rockies. Mm. The Valley of the Ten Peaks gets photographed by thousands of times per day. <laughs> but the idea for me that this one kind of weird cloud that came through, sure, and that's the one time it's probably gonna look like that nice. in my lifetime. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> so kind of fun. Um, I don't know how much time we have. I can go and go I, or we can wrap it up. I don't know. It depends on how hungry you are. <laughs> <laughs> we got people watching. We can keep going. Okay. Well, um, I think uh, another thing I talked about, the sandstone of the Southwest. So that's a subject for me as a landscape photographer that's been really interesting because, again, it's this natural feature of the earth that has these amazing colors and shapes and natural patterns that almost look maybe intentional or mm -hmm. somehow artistic and yet they're not they're purely just forces of nature that created them and then because it's sandstone the way it interacts with light is just amazing so i just have some photos of you know colorful interesting patterns and shapes and light interactions mm -hmm. in the southwest and you can wander around the the sandstone plateau of utah colorado arizona new mexico and beyond and other parts of the world. I was just in uh, Jordan recently and a lot of very similar types of mm. uh, formations in Jordan and I know in the Middle East and also in 
par parts of further east in Asia. So, so oh, wow. just endless possibilities yeah. uh, and colors and w the ways it interacts with light. So, so that's a lot of fun. Stunning. Lots of those. <laughs> you could do that forever. And some people oh, have sure. made their whole careers just with shooting sandstone. Yeah, absolutely. Um, another yeah. idea that I really like and uh, works great in landscape and also works great in cityscape is uh, the idea of kind of the light at the end of the tunnel. So mm. being in a dark place and you're not in the light, mm -hmm. but that there is light that you can see and you don't even see the light source. It's around the corner. Right. But the idea that I can walk around the corner into the light and that the light is showing me a little bit of something kind of promising or interesting or hopeful or whatever. Beautiful. So coming from this deep. And so, you know, that's in, in a cityscape. This is, oh, this is Slovenia. Is um, it? Oh. Peron. Oh, wonderful. Slovenia. Yep. There you go. Beautiful. That's got to be the first non-landscape photo of yours I think I've ever seen. Ah, I do every <laughs> once in a while. Yeah. Uh, I love to shoot cityscapes or architecturals, but I shoot them like the landscape. So sure. you'll notice, uh, you know, I'm here in these narrow cobbled streets in Peron, and I'm looking at this like it's a slot canyon. Mm -hmm. So if you'll notice, there's the, the light at the end of the tunnel. Right. And here it is in a slot canyon, also in Slovenia, uh, ah. but one of the gorges. And that light shining on the rocks in the background coming from this dark place through the tunnel into the light. Phenomenal. And here it is in an ancient um, castle in Jordan just a, a week ago, two weeks ago I was oh, there. Oh, okay. And again, in this castle and the light at the end of the tunnel. And actually two light sources here. So you've got the light at the top coming down and kind of illuminating this, this Jordanian woman who was talking on her cell phone there. <laughs> <laughs> but then this other light coming through this uh, turret to my left. So, so cool. Kind of fun. Um, light, nice. you know, just quality of light, you know, being yeah. out, fog, anything that will diffuse light. Mm -hmm. So foggy days, this is right here in the Rogue Valley. And then, then you compose around, you know, the light is there. Now, what can I put in the light? Mm -hmm. So, you know, driving around trees, fence posts, road going, disappearing in, into the Beautiful. light sort of thing. Love that. Uh, you know, foggy, diffused light coming into a forest, the redwood forest, and then having that light be able to fall on this rhododendron in bloom that's growing out of the side of a dead redwood tree is pretty cool. We really do live in an incredible area. Isn't we? it amazing? Yeah, yeah. And of course, the coast is a great place to get atmosphere and that oh, yeah. kind of glowy, soft, ethereal effect. For anybody who's not familiar with this uh, this phenomenon, what is this? What is this called? Uh, uh, this is uh, named Thor's Well. Yep. Uh, and it's basically a, a blow, uh, well, blowhole, no, there's a, there's a word for elevator shaft. And, you know, there's a lot of small ones that actually will shoot water, you know, up in the sky. You see them uh, you know, on the Oregon coast, Hawaii, I've seen them, different places where the wave comes in and then the water gets forced through this small opening and it shoots up a, mm -hmm. a plume of steam or whatever, water vapor. This is a big one. So the water comes up and it doesn't shoot up, but it spreads out across the top of the rocks. And then when the wave goes out, it all rushes back in and falls back into the hole. And so you have to be careful you don't get sucked in with it. Yeah. Uh, but it makes this really fun effect. Yeah, I would imagine that's uh quite dangerous to get too close to that and I wonder how many people have made that mistake. Yeah, I think once you went in, phenomenal. I don't think you're coming back out. No, no, I don't think you are. <laughs> yeah. Love it. Very cool. So, oh. and I've got lots and lots of photos. You, you yeah. pull the plug when you're ready. All right, well, right. let's let's jump back. There's a couple more questions <laughs> okay, that have come great. up and uh, and then we'll we'll call it a wrap here. So, Sebastian has got a follow-up. He says, sunrise or sunset or night perhaps, what is your favorite time of day? I am a sunrise person. Sunrise. I mean, I love the light at all kinds of times of day, and I think night photography is amazing. And that, and that's a whole new frontier of landscape photography with digital technology. I mean, you can now photograph, and I'm down the line somewhere. I've got some examples of you know, you can shoot star fields and the landscape at night, which before the sensitivity and the kind of sensors and um, software that you have now five, six years ago, it wasn't really even possible. And mm -hmm. certainly with film, you could do star trails, but that was about it. So I love night, uh, I love sunset, but I explained some of the kind of challenge with sunset. I'm not a night owl, so for me to stay up and shoot at night is really, really hard. Sure. Uh, I lose my motivation really quickly. Um, I'm a morning person. I love going out in the morning before light, kind of the mystery of the dark. It's quiet, it's calm, no one else is around. And then it's like this antici anticipation of what's gonna happen, you know, and what's the light gonna do? 
And then, you know, almost like a, a, a concert going into a crescendo, you know, is that sunrise. It can be, or it can be kind of a dud and a, and a disappointment. Sure, sure. You so never know. Sunrise is my time. Awesome. Great question. Great question. All right. Uh, Marcel has another question. Uh, Marcel, sorry. So sunrise and sunset provide the best light and colors. However, sometimes we find ourselves in the middle of the day in a beautiful place and we want to capture it. Is there a technique or filter or something that can help make the light a little softer so we can capture all the details better? It's another great question. It is. It is. Well, um, there's a variety of things that you can do. Um, you can't, but what you can't do, and this goes back to kind of what I was saying earlier, is that the 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 raw ingredients of a good photo have to be there for sure. me first. So I can't make lemonade out of lemons every time <laughs> or most of the time, you know? So just because, you know, I'm at the Grand Canyon, but it's noon and it's flat or it's a harsh direct overhead light, I'm probably not even gonna bother shooting because I just know I'm never gonna get that picture of the Grand Canyon right. to look, I'm gonna come back when I can actually get the light I want. Uh, but that doesn't mean you can't shoot all day. So, um, you know, if there is spotted overcast, you know, clouds that are letting light through. And so there's areas of light and shadow, variability of light all day long. That can be great. Um, if it's complete blue sky overhead, um, you know, there's no filter necessarily. I know that will make that kind of harsh light all of a sudden look dreamy and warm and yeah. nice. There may be, but none, none that I'm using. I mean, you can... You can change the color of the sky with a polarizer, but it's not going to affect the fact that you have right. the shadows are just right. almost non-existent. If the sun's straight, coming straight down, or it's just very flat lighting. Right. Yeah. Yeah. What really makes an, an, uh, an image, one of the things that makes an image interesting is that variability of light, interplay of light and shadow. Right. And if all you have is light, no shadow, unless you somehow create shadow, <laughs> um, then not that interesting. Yeah. But what I do is when it's totally just bright sky, no clouds, no variability of light, is I go to the shadows. So I will find something that's in shadow that's adjacent to something that's bright, brightly mm. lit. And in those shadows, it's basically twilight. And you've got reflected light coming in, and now you've got subtlety and softness. So a lot of those photos that I was showing of sandstone, mm -hmm. some of those were shot at twilight. So the okay. sun has set. So that's reflected light off the atmosphere bouncing down and washing with this nice, warm, soft, even light. But some of the other ones are middle of the day. I'm either in a deep canyon hmm. or I'm in it. There's a rock feature casting a shadow. In that shadow is something to photograph. And here's another rock feature that the light is bouncing off of, like a big reflector, like the sky or mm -hmm. like, you know, uh, and shining that now light into the shadow. So a lot of time what I'll do is look for the shadows or look for a canyon or great. whatever on that kind of light. That's, that's great advice. Look for the shadows. Look for the shadows. All right, looks like the last one in here. Okay. Uh, BJ Stockton says, do you have any tips for shooting landscapes with a telephoto lens? What do you look for when deciding on using a longer focal length? Do you shoot a lot of your landscapes with long lenses? I do, I do. Um, and that's one of the great things is that um, when you shoot landscapes... Um, do you want to go on? Uh, well, can I get to the, yeah. the slide reel there oh, so sure, I here. can see? Or no, that's fine, that's fine. I want to see if I have an example. Okay, here's a great example. This is shot, I think this is over 200 millimeters, maybe closer to 300 millimeters. Okay. I'm miles away from this peak down in the valley. Um, it's this amazingly gorgeous peak and it's a gorgeous scene all around me. Mm -hmm. But this is where that peak is the show. And even though it's this little tiny feature on the horizon, if I put on my long lens and zoom on it, and I know it's also the highest thing around, it's gonna catch the very first light and mm. I know that the clouds behind it are gonna catch the light even before the peak. And so that's a great example of, even though I can't be right up next to the mountain, uh, I can make it look like I am by putting on that long lens. So that's one example of, you know, I want to simplify. I've mm -hmm. got this big, huge, wide open expanse of Patagonia around me. And if I shoot at wide angle, the thing that's the real show, at least at this point, is going to be a little pinprick on right. the horizon. Right, right, right. Time for a long lens. Time for a long lens. And that's yeah. what I'll do. I'll look around a big scene and it's like, do I want everything? Is everything the picture? Mm -hmm. Or is there something within the scene that's the picture that's just far away? Time to put on the long lens. Perfect. Um, let's see. Another idea of that. Let's see if I can get here. Um, well, let's see if I've got one. The idea of compression, mm. you know, bringing things together, making, yeah, here we go. 
So uh -huh. this place. is, yeah, this is our, this is the town we live in. This is Ashland, Oregon. Um, and that's Mount Ashland above the town in, in fall. And I'm far away. I'm probably a mile or a mile and a half from town and probably 10 or 12 miles as the crow flies from Mount Ashland. Mm -hmm. And to shoot this with a white, with a wide angle lens, Mount Ashland, this looks like a, a a bump on yeah. a ridge. Right. But by using the long telephoto lens, I compress it. It looks like the mountain is right above town and it looks like the mountain is towering over town. <laughs> so that's another great place to yeah, use a incredible. telephoto lens in yep. the landscape. Love it. Beautiful. Well, very good. Looks like we're out of questions there, which is awesome. uh, good. I think we're, <laughs> we're out of time and I'm hungry. I don't know about you. It's uh, time I'm, for I'm hungry and uh, yeah, I've, I, there's never a question of whether I haven't talked enough. <laughs> <laughs> wherever I go. Perfect. Love it. Well, thank you so much for coming on. This Thanks for having good. me. I, I love really doing this. It. I love doing this. And I still like the idea of we sit here and drink wine and do this. There you go. Yeah. Uh, and don't have to talk about my stuff. Just get whatever. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have to schedule one of those for sure as well. Okay. And thank you everyone for watching and thanks for watching live. Those who, who, uh, who were able to do that and for participating with your questions. You can, if you're watching this after the live broadcast, you can continue to post questions in there. And uh, depending on Sean's time, I'm not going to commit him to anything, but I'm sure he'll be happy to get in there and answer the ones that he can. I absolutely um, do. That's one of the things I enjoy doing, so I will. Wonderful. Very good. So post those questions in there if you're seeing this after the fact. And uh, again, thank you. If you uh, have, if this is all new to you, this whole photojustice conversations thing, these are archived over on my website at photoapps.expert. Head over there and you can find more of these videos as well as going to the YouTube channel. Uh, if you just go to photojustice.com slash moments, you'll be taken to something that is a bit different than this show, but a live daily photography show that I do called Photo Justice Photo Moments. You can just search for that as well on YouTube and you'll find it. So please be sure to like and subscribe to the channel when you see those. Absolutely. And again, the lower third down here has all of Sean's information. So you got the outdoorexposurephoto.com for his website, Sean Bagshaw Photography on Facebook and just Sean Bagshaw on Twitter. That's so be it. sure to like and follow all of those. That's it. We're out of here. Thanks again, Sean. I really appreciate you coming on. That was fun. My pleasure. Let's go get some food. Lunchtime. Excellent. Excellent.